You've already heard the latest on the Zika virus. There's no doubt it has infected headlines worldwide, spreading explosively, suspected of links to birth defects and neurological symptoms. There are travel advisories and fears it could spread north. But with stories like this, there's a fine line between readiness and panic. So, time to get the facts. Joining me tonight, Danielle Martin is a family physician at Women's College Hospital. Isaac Bogosh is an infectious disease physician at the Toronto General Hospital. And Cameron Kahn is an infectious disease physician at St. Michael's Hospital. So, so much talk, so much focus on this virus this week. Safe to say you've all been getting a few phone calls. Absolutely. <laughs> what, what are you hearing? What are people concerned about? And, and what do you tell them? How concerned do they need to be? Well, we've, we've been getting a lot of calls from uh, people who are thinking about traveling to a country that might be affected with Zika virus. Uh, a lot of the calls are coming from people who are pregnant or people who might be considering becoming pregnant in the in the near future. That's been the majority of the calls I've been receiving. And yeah. what do you say? Like we can get into yeah. the details, I suppose, in yeah. a moment. But overall, in terms of an infectious disease scare, how, how scary is this? Well, I mean, it's certainly uh, uh, some... Uh, it's an infection that's spread rather quickly throughout the Americas. And, uh, and there's certainly many, many people that have been infected with it. Of course, the concern is with pregnant women traveling, the, uh, the potential link between infection and uh, birth defect. And that's why we've been getting a lot of phone calls from uh, Canadian travelers who are thinking about going down there. So, Cameron, what do you say when people call and say, I'm thinking of traveling? I think the main issue really is with pregnant women. Uh, for everyone else, about 80% of the people who get an infection don't really have any symptoms or anything that's significant, and 20% generally have mild symptoms that last a week or so. Uh, for pregnant women, um, the risk, as we've heard, is this potential risk of, uh, of microcephaly, this, uh, you know, babies born with small heads and underdeveloped brains. So for those women, it's really consider postponing travel if you can, and if you can't, really take measures to minimize mosquito bites when you're when you're down there. So Daniel you'll deal with uh, Danielle you deal with a lot of childbearing age women are they you must be getting a lot we're of getting calls. a lot of phone calls and I do have a lot of pregnant patients in my practice who are wondering you know that vacation we were planning on taking before the baby comes should we cancel it um, and in general where it's reasonable to do so I have been telling my patients that the World Health Organization is advising that they should cancel their travel um, but for people who have to go for work or other reasons and then of course, for the millions and millions of women who live in these countries, um, practicing mosquito safety um, is uh, is a good second best option. And so, pregnant women should, or women thinking of getting, should slather themselves in DEET. That's yes. So, de DEET is safe in pregnancy, um, and it's much better to use DEET than to uh, become infected. So, absolutely, they should use DEET containing mosquito repellent, uh, wear long sleeved clothing, etc. So how long does it stay if you are infected? How, how long does it stay in your blood and how long should people be careful about engaging in activities that lead to babies? <laughs> well, uh, if someone was bit by an, a mosquito that was infected with this virus, the incubation period, the, that's the time from getting bit to the time of actually having uh, symptoms of the infection, if they have symptoms, is typically about four to five days. It's not going to be longer than two weeks. And when the virus is present in someone's body, usually the virus is going to be present in someone's blood for seven days or less. So it's safe to say that, uh, well, we don't, know, we don't have all the answers right now, but it's probably okay to, uh, to conceive if someone uh, returns from a Zika virus affected area one to two months after returning. Again, I should stress that we don't have all the answers yet. That's probably a safe bet. What do you say to, the, to, to people about, do you tell them not to go? <laughs> Well, again, you know, going back to the issue of the, the travel advisory, I mean, this is one of those events where we don't quite know how to quantify the risk just yet. You know, we don't know what the, we call this the denominator here in epidemiology, is we don't quite see uh, all of the infections. So what we're seeing and observing is the tip of the iceberg. Everything that's beneath that, these are all the infections that we can't see. Um, it makes it difficult to quantify risk. So I think this is where we've been hearing this phrase, out of an abundance of caution, we've heard this quite a bit that women should consider postponing their travel to these areas. Uh, and for others, you know, they should be aware of Zika virus, but the risks to them are probably not that significant. And Danielle, there is one case, possibly, of, of infection of a, of a man who was there and infected his partner when he came back. Are you telling people if they're involved with someone who's traveled? To like, how far does this go? No, so I mean, literally one or maybe two cases of sexually transmitted uh, Zika virus to our knowledge on the globe. And so the overwhelming majority of cases 
are going to be mosquito transmitted. So for the time being, the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control are not ad advising people to uh, avoid contact with a person who has traveled, and that includes sexual contact. The general assumption has been that the exposure, the danger is not here, that Canadian mosquitoes uh, can't transmit this virus, but th there is now a scientist, a researcher who's looking into this to, to make sure, do we need to worry, do Canadians need to worry about being bitten here in the summer, obviously not yeah. I think the concern would be uh, there, there'd just be uh, an extremely low to almost zero percent risk here in Canada. And we can learn from other similar viruses uh, about this. So there's two other viruses. One's called dengue fever. The other's called chikungunya. And they're transmitted by the exact same mosquito species that transmit this Zika virus. And to date, there's been uh, very few cases of dengue fever and very few cases of chikungunya fever transmitted as far north as the southernmost part of the United States. So it's extremely unlikely that something like this would ever make its way up to Canada. Uh, what's your sense, Kevin? You know, I, I think it's always good to keep our lines of inquiry open. You know, we're, we're in an emergency situation. Um, it's good to sort of make sure that we don't get too invested into our uh, assumptions. Um, but I think I agree completely with Isaac. I, I don't think that it's very likely, based on the experience with chikungunya and dengue, and also we're talking about a mosquito that is not the primary mosquito for Zika virus, Aedes aegypti. We're talking about Aedes albopictus is further close to Canada. Um, and we don't even know yet if that actually is a very effective transmitter of this virus. So to put it in perspective, I don't think Canadians should be you know, too concerned about the risk of Zika transmission within this country. But as with other scares that we've had in the past, there's a lot of things we don't know, right? I mean, what is it that you want to know, Daniel? I mean, for me, because I see so many women of reproductive age, I think that the questions that remain about uh, whether Zika virus does indeed cause birth defects, and if so, when are the higher risk versus the lower risk periods in a pregnancy in terms of exposure. We don't know um, that yet? We don't know. There, we are, there are lots of hypotheses and assumptions, but we don't actually know um, what the method is um, that the virus may cause these kinds of uh, malformations in newborns. And remember that that's got a real impact. While Canadian women here in Canada don't necessarily need to be losing sleep over this, this is a huge global health yeah. issue and a big issue for the populations in these countries that are se seriously affected. So we really, I'm really hoping that we're going to see the science advance quickly in helping us to understand those the answers to those questions. And a possible link to Guillain-Barre syndrome. What, how serious is that? What else do we not know, need to know? So there have been a few, uh, a, a small spike in cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome where there have been Zika virus outbreaks. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, for the viewers who don't know, it's a neurologic syndrome manifested by weakness in the lower part of the body that can sometimes ascend to the upper part of the body. And this is a rare complication of many, many, many different viral infections. It looks like Zika virus is just added to the long list of viral infections that this may be associated with. And it would be a very rare manifestation of, uh, or a rare complication of the Zika virus infection. What else do you want to know? What are you watching for? Uh... You know, I think there, there's been some discussion about uh, vaccine development um, to see exactly where does that go. My sense is, and I'm not in the vaccine development cycle, but that, you know, the regulatory processes and all of the research that needs to be done, my sense is that we're a long ways away. Uh, with the Ebola vaccine, that was in development for years before uh, the epidemic happened in West Africa. But I think it would be very important for us to, to understand where the science is in terms of vaccine development. How soon could we have a vaccine? Because in terms of mitigating or slowing this down, uh, that's going to be one of the most important interventions we have uh, available. Yeah. We see the pictures of those little babies. We hear about thousands of cases possibly linked. I mean, it is actually terrifying. And, and we know that uh, in the past there were questions about SARS and questions about Ebola, and we learned more going on. How, how strong a handle do we have on this one, do you think? Well, we've certainly seen, you know, uh, the World Health Organization move much more quickly um, in this instance. And so um, I do think that the international public health, the global health community is much, uh, much more attuned to uh, the potential impact uh, of this outbreak. Uh, but again, there, there, there are still a lot of questions, uh, more questions than answers in a lot of, of, of areas. And so um, it remains to be seen whether it's possible that there's something that we're going to discover we were behind the eight ball on. And that's why I think it is important for us all to be following this story. Isaac? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, pleased that the WHO is meeting on Monday for this uh, emergency meeting. And it just shows that there is international co uh, coordination and cooperation on this. And this might help uh, affected countries 
uh, coordinate a, a unified public health response. And this will facilitate communications between affected countries. So uh, hopefully we can have a better understanding of where this virus is, where this virus is going, uh, and have a, an international response to vaccine development and, uh, and mosquito control efforts as well. And as horrifying as, as it may be, it's, it's not as deadly as, as far as I remember. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, uh, like Cameron said earlier, the vast majority of people that get infected aren't even going to know they even had the infection. So that's a good thing. Well, we'll be watching. There's a, a vaccine. How long would that take? Do we have any idea? You know, I think probably realistically before a vaccine gets into someone's arms, I think we're talking years. Uh, that would be my guess. I know there have been some suggestions that maybe something could, could uh, you know, be launched uh, sooner than that. But I think that's probably fairly optimistic. I think we're probably looking at years. All righty. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see what the uh, World Health Organization says, if this is actually a, a global emergency. Um, it's certainly a concern. Thank you so much.